We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the therapy show behind closed doors and we're up to I'm looking on my list here but we're up to episode 148. Now this one is 148. You sound shocked. Yes yeah, so, I mean I was I was listening to the first ever um therapy behind closed doors when uh, we were introducing ourselves. We were babies uh, Bob. <laughs> I was 70 and I'm 73 now and we were talking about um what we wanted to do well what we wanted from the podcast and uh I enjoyed listening to that because you're talking about your history and also talking about your vision for the podcast which I think we've achieved I was just about to ask you have we achieved it I need to go yeah. back and listen to what we said <laughs> yeah it was talking about demystifying or we were talking about um, our objectives of demystifying what was, you know, what happened in the therapy room. And I was talking about the importance of that. And you were talking about that as a major goal. I was talking about the co created nature of these podcasts, which, you know, stand us out, really. Yeah, I think so. We, we, we're spreading far and wide, Bob, I think. You'd oh, yeah. You were saying said that they've listened to us. <laughs> who, who said that? When when I, I do ice water therapy, so I go out and swim in, you know, ponds here, there be and careful, everywhere. Yeah, careful. and and I, I'm always careful. I don't do it on my own. Um, but, yeah, I was talking to somebody and just happened to mention the pod, you know, that I do podcasts and they listen to it. So there you wow. go. I know you said that you visited, I think, Spotify, uh, which said that we had we've had 61,000 hits so far. Yeah. More than that now, yeah. That's quite good. That's very good. It is, absolutely. And it's all down to the listeners. Obviously, the content and the titles that you come up with help, Bob. (laughs) So talking about the titles, what we're going to be looking at this time is the pressure cooker effect in therapy. Another good one. Yes, yes. Uh, What I meant by it is that when I was a kid growing up, my mother had this huge silver massive pressure cooker i don't mm. know if you still buy them that yeah, way with the lid that clicks yeah. Shut. yeah 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 and of course what happens to pressure cookers is that the pressure builds up <laughs> pulls up and builds up and then all of a sudden it sort of goes yeah. if that's the right sound anyway and uh there's a cathartic release perhaps on the pressure cooker but uh when i think of it in terms of psychotherapy and I think psychotherapy is a bit like that. Yeah. When people first come to therapy, they don't really know what to expect unless they've had some therapy before and they still then don't know what to expect because they're usually at a different different developmental phase. But they don't know what to expect. And so their defences are usually quite stoic, if you like. Um, they're usually testing the therapist out. Uh, they're usually kind of wary of sharing their vulnerabilities absolutely yeah and it's a different type of therapy right at the beginning it's much more about listening to their story being a witness to their story helping them um believe in us and getting their trust so they can actually start letting those defenses down which was so necessary years ago, but perhaps doesn't help in terms of where they want to go now. Yeah. And I, I think that sort of process, as they start to get to trust us and believe in the process of psychotherapy and the therapist in front of them, is a bit like the beginning of a pressure, you know, pressure book of effect. Yeah. Cycle. Yeah. And for me, when when I read this title, because I once I usually you know before we do it have a quick think about what what comes up for me with the titles that you've got, because I don't think we're always on the same wavelength sometimes. <laughs> but for me, I was thinking about 
you know, potential confrontation in the therapy process when we're challenging our clients, maybe. Mm. Because in the early days, when I first trained, I hand on heart can honestly say I didn't challenge my clients at all. I was frightened to challenge my clients. Oh. Whereas now I will, I want to say, pick them up on certain things. When I think they're people pleasing me or they're saying what they think they should say, I will challenge them and say, is that actually true? <laughs> mm. Mm. You know, when they say that they're okay, but the body language is telling me something completely different. And what do you think that confrontation does or is it aimed at? Well, I'm very careful on when I do it. I wouldn't be confrontational at the early stages of therapy. I've already built up, you know, a therapeutic alliance, let's say, with my clients or whatever. But it's more about them being okay with their authentic feelings rather than the things that they think they should be doing or they should be saying mm. and a way of reflecting on things maybe mm. Mm. so are you also saying that you know with these sort of confrontation which is a psychoanalytical term also i'm talking about positive confrontation here absolutely yeah um sort of adds to sort of pressure cooker effect i think so mm -hmm. that that my understanding is yeah that, that sometimes you know the, emotions can build in the therapy session and it, it's how one we acknowledge that and how we can release that through the therapy if there is something so in a way you are you are tweaking their defense systems aren't you yeah, I'd like to think so. I'm I'm thinking, you know, this week in particular, I was seeing a couple who was saying very nice things, but the body language was saying that they were really frustrated with each other. Mm -hmm. So I kind of challenged that what they were saying and said, do you know what I mean, that I'm seeing some annoyance or aggravation in the body language. Is that what's going on? And it opened up a whole different area for us to discuss. Mm, mm, oh, that's good. That's a very good way of looking at these things. And um, I often use, well, I used to use the term a lot in therapeutic practice um, when I talk to clients specifically in groups. I actually use this uh, analogy more. And I say, okay, so we can see what's going on here and perhaps at, at a later time we might get back to it and perhaps look at how let's make something up how you find difficulty expressing emotions for example yeah and as i think timing is key in psychotherapy i might say something okay we'll come back at a later day and just allow your pressure cooker to just mull over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because so, it's a really good metaphor. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a smile about the same time because it's like just by saying that, then, you know, it's ranking up the pressure um, in terms of how, how stoic are the defense systems. Yeah. It's another, another way of measuring um, their defense systems. And I'm only really talking about, <clears throat> you know, in this case, you know, we're talking about 2024 defense systems. I'm not talking about so much when those defense systems were first originated because they were originated for survival reasons. Mm. But we're now in, I don't know how many years later, where the defense, defense systems perhaps are may be stronger or even less stronger and they need to break the habit yes. of the repetitive process so they can integrate a new process or a new idea yeah and they've almost forgotten now to allow themselves to be vulnerable and let those defense systems down because they were built for survival purposes yeah so there's no way that a therapist 
um, goes through the front door. You know, it's like they need to allow themselves to get to know the clients and XXX. And then the clients in their own time will start to allow themselves to be vulnerable or allow the pressure cooker to be released. If you yeah. Know. Yeah, and it doesn't need to all be done in one go. You know, on the pressure oh, cooker, no. there is a little knob where we can just release a little bit of pressure over, over time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, my favourite sort of phrase is going to come out now, Jackie. Oh, which you've heard thousands and millions of times. Oh, yes. I do see it's a process yeah. and never an event. It's yeah. not just like we, you know, this is about really um, seeing therapy as a process. Yeah. And, you know, you're using the analogy of, of the pressure cooker is kind of, you know, we can look at how our clients regulate their emotions or the intensity or, you know, strong feelings in the therapy room as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's a really good point there in terms of emotional regulation. Yeah. And if they've never been modelled or they haven't got appropriate emotional regulation, then their pressure cooker will just burst off or steam out really quickly. Yeah, absolutely. In, in appropriate ways. And I think it's a very common theme in psychotherapy where a person may come because they don't find it or they aren't able for whatever reasons to appropriately regulate their emotions. Yeah. It needs the therapist not only to model how to do that for the client, but also to look at what happened in their process where they weren't learnt or weren't able to regulate their emotions in an appropriate, healthy way. Yeah. And and it's an ideal opportunity <clears throat> to model that, do you know what I mean? Now we can do that. Oh, oh. Yeah. And of course, they're in charge of their own pressure cooker. Yes. It isn't the therapist is in charge of it. No. All the therapist does in a way is stoke that. In in what you often a technical word anyway for this is called paradoxical inter paradoxical interventions. You know what? In other words, in TA terms, another word would be to um, tweak the impasse. Yeah. So an impasse is where there's two opposing psychological forces. I don't want to do it. Uh, and another voice says, "What well, do you better do it? I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Well, I'm not. I am going." So you've got two opposing voice forces. Um, so somehow, if you can help the client um, go through this impasse or two stuck places, then their pressure cooker can often ease off. Yeah. See, when, when you're talking about an impasse and things like that, I automatically think about the internal critic. <laughs> do you know what I mean? When we want to do something and there's that voice inside us that says, no, you, you can't do that, but you really want to do it. So there's, like you said, there's this internal dialogue that's going on all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So for a lot of people, they may have positive yeah. Voices were yeah. in a healthy system. Yeah. What you're talking about, and the clients we see often who have low self esteem or might have a tendency for over, over depression or have a tendency for overthinking or be agitated, anxiety, and all these things where their self agency is limited, what they often report is what you're saying here is yeah. an intensity of a critical narrative. In, in other words, as part of themselves where they're saying, oh, God, gosh, I could have done it that way. I should have done it that way. How stupid I am. I X, 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 and X. You know, and it gets more intense and gets more intense. And they tell themselves off more and more so they feel more uh, anxious and they start overthinking and their self-esteem goes down. They think they've got no value. They feel worthless. They go to a dark place. They've got depression. And then this negative critical voice gets even more intense and more intense and the pressure cooker builds up and builds up and they have no way to regulate, stop, yeah, you know, prick the intense. And often they go to a place of shutting off completely. They might go to a place of self-harm 
they might go to a place where they do extremely unhealthy things and attempt to stop that pressure cooker building up with these intense negative voices that you're talking about. Yeah. And um, in therapy, one of the methods, if you like, or a way of thinking about this is to help the client um, ease off that pressure cooker in a healthy way so they can start regulating, desensitizing, um, you know, the intensity of those vo voices and prick that boil, which is growing and growing, and they feel powerless and lose self-agency. Yeah. And that's I think quite that's... a long narrative, but that's what, how I see it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's that's the important thing is that they start to learn that they can control the response and the reaction. Yeah, that inner dialogue might still be there, but we don't need to listen to it. Do you know what I mean? There, there are ways that we can understand what's going on. Yeah, and usually, you know, Jack, at the beginning of this pressure cooker, I don't know if it's the beginning, but I'm going it, it, to, is that they lose sight or become a, you know, they're unaware that that voice is someone else's. Mm. They feel it themselves. Yeah. And one of the big steps in psychotherapy, as you and I know, is to help the client be aware that it's not their voices. Those voices come from somewhere else. And that is such a crucial time in psychotherapy where they can take ownership. Yeah of the the voices yeah absolutely because i think what you know when i can remember lots of instances when i started talking with clients about the you know the internal dialogue and the voices that we hear and everything and i always do a caveat on it that we all have that inner dialogue it doesn't mean that we're schizophrenic. It doesn't mean that we've got a split personality. It's understanding exactly what you've just said. Whose voice is that and where does it come from? Yeah. I I, I remember once where I was doing therapy, we were doing therapy and um, we were talking about, I think it was, I think it was these voices she was hearing um, or, the, or the negative things that she used to say about herself. And she went off to the toilet. She's kind of she went off the toilet. Anyway, she'd been off quite a while. I don't know, four or five minutes. But I got a real concern that she, you know, she, she hadn't come back in the time I thought was supposed. So I went back. Anyway, went out the door and she was in the corridor banging her head against the wall. Wow. And when I, you know, got her to stop that and grounded her she said i'm attempting to get rid of these voices which i'm hearing all the time so the pressure cooker had been building up and yeah. building up and the parental voice is becoming stronger and stronger and we need a therapist to help her deal with the you know desensitization of that pressure cooker and get to help them realize but it's not their narrative. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's that's really valid and important because then it's about them, you know, being able to self-regulate that and understand the process and, you know, be able to take the, the pressure off the pressure cooker themselves outside of therapy. Yeah, that's... That's, that's, that's the very... outcome, that's the goal. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I used to run five-day what I call psychotherapy intensives back in the day. So people would come to my institute, would start at nine o'clock till six o'clock, five days a week. I mean, they'd, they'd go home. I mean, they'd go home and come back. Yeah. And I used to use that phrase a lot because, you know, I, I could see the pressure building up with somebody. And I knew that it, if I tackled the defense systems or the voices that were building up or whatever was going on on the first day, that it wouldn't be so as effective 
as perhaps four days later. Yeah. So another phrase I used to say was, okay, well, I hear what we've got, we're contracting here, and let's allow things to percolate and we'll see mm -hmm. where we get to in four days' time. And we'll co come back to that. Yeah. Timing. I, I can see how that would work as well, because, it, you know, that, that's a really good way, word for it, because when we're learning about these things, things yeah. do percolate. We do need to mull over them and explore things. And yeah. it's an it's a new a new way of being. So it's not going to happen overnight. It's kind of I, I often talk about osmosis. Do you know what I mean? It kind of seeps in slowly sometimes. That's right. No one level that like I said earlier in the podcast to say something else about this. At one level, they're in control of their own pressure cooker. Yeah. At another level, they're in therapy because they feel they're not in control of the process. Yeah. Do you think people are always in control? They just don't know it. It's a really good question, of course. The way I was thinking about it was in terms of psych psychological time and real time. Right. So, in other words, we take back, if we think developmentally, uh, and we go back to when, you know, when they were younger, the, pa the power dynamics often in the family system or where they were were so against them. In other yeah. words, the significant other people or the parents or the toxicity, it was very much one up, one down. Yeah. So they felt they had no power. You know, so it's like Hobson's choice. Um, which is it? It's like, well, if you're in a dangerous situation where the power dynamics are so highly against you, you'll do whatever you can to do survive. So at that level, maybe you have a choice so you may switch off you may dissociate you might go crazy you might do lots of things uh, so the, in that sense they've got a choice but the people in that level of, of trauma don't believe they have a choice absolutely yeah yeah so yes and no is my answer to that and they come to therapy sort of 20 years later, 25 years later, and start talking about how they are today in their PTSD, PTSD post-traumatic stress disorder, or, or whatever the, the symptoms are they come with. Even though I know the work is back in their history, doesn't matter where we start really, well it does, we have to start with their story in the present. The, uh, they can only get to a place of being aware that they actually do have choice now, now yeah. in the present day, yeah, by realizing what they didn't have all those years ago. Yeah, yeah. I can remember when I was going through my training, and one of the reasons why I love transactional analysis and being a psychotherapist because at the time I was fostering, and it, it, it there was a lot of doom and gloom about fostering. Do you know what I mean? That the damage is done and they'll never get over it. And it was all, you know, write them off. They're never going to go to university. They're not going to amount all this sort of stuff. And what transactional analysis and psychotherapy taught me was that we can go back and fill in the gaps. We can repair it. We can learn about all of this stuff, you know, and it doesn't necessarily have to impact us for the rest of our life, whatever trauma we've been through. Yeah, There's and that wonderful... made me very hopeful. <laughs> what a wonderful way to put this. There's a wonderful book written by the originators of redecision psychotherapy from the transaction analysis movement, and they were Mary and Bob Goulding. And they wrote yeah. a book, they wrote several books, but they wrote, wrote a really fantastic book in 1973 called The Powers in the Patient. Now, in American language, the patient is the client. Right, yeah. Firstly, often I think many therapists forget that. They may often think the power's in them, and it's not. It's, it's actually in the client, in the patient, put it that way. And I think it's really important therapists remember that. But And also, on the same level, if we do this developmental work, then they often don't feel they have any power. Mm. So, 
it's important for therapists to remember that that's true and a lot of the time that is the therapy in other words they don't feel they have the power yeah but the therapy is getting to a place where they can take back the power that perhaps they gave away lost or put in a very precious compartmental place in their psychological spirit so they can be different today yeah i would recommend that book every time and uh through many of my clinical journeys i remember that phrase because sometimes and i like to think it didn't happen that often i could get carried away with my own ego yeah but we don't have power we, we make an impact yeah. we help people find their own power yeah alongside them in the witness on their journey and we help them take ownership of their own agency and self-power however in the end it's the client that needs to take the power for the new decisions to reintegrate and to be able to dis discover their own self-agency and we help them on the way absolutely yeah I see it as we kind of shine a light on certain things that then they can explore and, like you say, integrate into their life or, yeah. Mm. Now, of course, I don't want to under, I don't want any of the therapist counselors who's listening to this podcast uh, to think counselors and therapists don't do anything. They are pivotal in helping the client discover the power uh, that perhaps they have uh, put away or even forgot they had. Yeah. I see, a, you know, a big part of my job, rightly or wrongly, is to provide a safe space for people to explore this stuff, <laughs> to put it bluntly. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like to be in con control of the pressure cooker. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And to feel safe knowing that they, I think for some clients, it can be really scary and they teeter on the edge of making a new decision or doing something different. And I think part of my job is to support them in, in stepping over into that, knowing that I've kind of got the back. Yes, yeah, a very good phrase that you've got their back. Yeah. That it's it's okay because it's a massive it's a big thing making changes in therapy, you know when when I think of me you know forty years or forty plus years before I started doing my my training, that there's a lot of stuff in there for me to be changing. Yeah, and you've helped a lot of people. And there's another very good book written by the same person or people. Bob and Mary Goulding, After the Power and the Patient, I think, unless I've got it the wrong way around, 1974, called Redecision Psychotherapy. And they talk, I think it is the one after Power and the Patient, but uh, they're talking there about how they help people take ownership of their own power mm -hmm. to make new redecisions. And they couldn't do it, and, and they wouldn't be able to do it if they didn't feel they were in a safe, secure place to explore this, to be able to, with the therapist's help, uh, find the power they often disavowed. Yeah. I think also the therapist needs to be more powerful than the toxic people in their head. Yeah. I you always know, remember that from my training. Is it protection, permission, importance, or mm. permission, protect? Well, you, I don't know what order they come in, but yeah, that's always stuck in. Yeah, because you'll repeat history with the client if you're not. Yeah. Just one of those thousands of other people who haven't been able to stand up to the negative, critical parents in their own heads. Yeah. What an interesting topic, Bob. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think we talk about the real mechanics of effective psychotherapy here. Yeah. 
And it, it all comes from that title about a pressure cooker, which I think is a brilliant metaphor yeah. for a lot of things that go on in everyday life. Yeah, and, you know, from helping them understand they have a pressure cooker in the first place and then helping them regulate the pressure, co pressure cooker system and then help them take ownership in a, in a much more bigger way, they can then... Go, they're on the road to what I would call um, positive self-agency. Yeah, because I was thinking, you, you you touched on group therapy before, and you, I, for some reason, have no idea why, but I'm seeing an awful lot of couples at the moment. But the therapy room can be seen as a pressure cooker when you're dealing with more than one person, when there's couples. You know, they're yeah, both absolutely. bringing the, the issues that they've got, and it can be quite a, a heated discussion that goes on sometimes well there's two people often with interlocking scripts or opposing scripts who trigger off their own internal pressure cookers or the others yeah. and you imagine that multiplied by eight people yeah many many pressure cookers get triggered off group therapy is an extraordinarily powerful mechanism for effective psychotherapeutic change as is couples therapy. Um, so I'm glad you've got more couples because um, that I think there's not enough people who specialize in couples work and group work for yeah. whatever reasons. In 19, you know, the early 19, oh, when was it? 19, early 90s, group psychotherapy in the UK was much more popular than it is now. Um, I, I've been toying with the idea, Bob, I shouldn't put this out there, but I have been toying with the idea purely and simply because I think a lot of people struggle and can't afford individual therapy and it's a way right. of them accessing lower yeah. cost when they're in a group. So I have been toying with the idea. If you Maybe do we it, we need to have a discussion about it. <laughs> please do. And if you do do it, make sure they've spent a bit of time in individual therapy with you yeah. first. Otherwise, you'll lose them. Yes. But I do think it's a very effective um, type of therapy, group therapy, and all these pressure group, uh, pressure cookers get, can often get triggered off. And that's when the therapist can help the client not only be aware of the pressure cookers that have been triggered off, but also what triggers the pressure cookers and hopefully eventually not only do they regulate their own pressure cookers, but they can actually take charge of that process and develop a new, healthy, integrated process. Yeah. Because yeah. just to finish up on this topic, I, as you were talking then, I was thinking, you know, that you've got a room of eight people and they've all got their, their pressure cookers. Everybody's life up to this point is unique and individual to them. Yeah. But do you think that from our point of view, there's lots of similarities in what people go through in their upbringing. Does that there's, make sense? Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, we know this. Uh, as we, as I was just thinking of articles people will know, like the eight stages of men, the Eric Erickson's uh, developmental uh, articles where they talk about people going through different, sorry, similar stages, uh, you know, and you know yourself from that wonderful book that you quote by, you know, the... the, the Pam this, Levin. <laughs> yeah, Pam Levin, The Cycles of Power. Yes, yeah. So so definitely, we do. Freud used to talk about different developmental stages. Yeah. We, that's I taken as read. I think we have similarities that we go through different psychological stages that if they have been missed out or there's been a fixation or there's been trauma, then that obviously may result in challenging consequences later. Yeah. So I think by definition. And then I think about, um, and I need another podcast for this, but, you know, when we're born, from the day we're born, you know, I think there's an element of trauma. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. So there's certainly trauma from the, 
point of giving birth, so they must yeah, be well, on so the other side of it. This wonderful womb, which is very serial cure and oh. safe, hopefully being wrenched out or coming out to this uh, very different world, is to, can be seen as traumatic. Absolutely, and, yeah. You know, from the very beginning of psychological life, I think there can be challenges of trauma. And if they aren't dealt with in a healthy way, then consequences could be psychologically may be difficult later on. Mm. So yes, I think there are similar thematic developmental problems, traumas that people may occur. Yeah. And how we deal with them are often, well, there are unique, our own unique experiences, aren't they? Absolutely. I think that's where the uniqueness comes in, is the decisions that we make around those things These and how we're going to be in, in the world. Developmental yeah. process. I mean, Richard Erskine, another mentor of mine and the chair, or past chair anyway, but certainly was the founder of the International Integrative Psychotherapy Association. He wrote a whole series of articles around uh, what he called uh, relational needs or unmet relational needs uh, um, and permissions that need to be given almost universally by the therapists to enable the clients, if you like, to deal with these unmet needs and the developmental deficits that have occurred. But in that, how the client experiences and defends against the developmental deficits are unique. Yes. Yeah. I've really enjoyed that, Bob. Thank you very much. Does that make sense, that last bit? Absolutely, yeah. It's yeah. really important for therapists because if therapists just think, well, I've read this article, I've done all this, like, I can do this, a bit like chess, like I was talking about in the last podcast, then X will happen. Well, that's one way of looking at it, and I've talked about it in the last podcast. Another way, and a much more important, I think we need to see the clients have their own unique experiences, attuned to those unique experiences, and go with that in terms of potency, potency, permissions, and everything else. Because in another process altogether, it's not like chess. Yeah. I'm a great fan of relational psychotherapy. So Another way to call me my work in, in a way is relationally developmental in nature uh, for effective psychotherapy. Yeah. That's a mouthful, isn't it? It certainly is, but it's a good title <laughs> to have, Bob. I like that one. <laughs> and I know you're very relational in your developmental work. I am. I do. I do like. Do you know what I mean? Looking at things relationally, and one one of the things that one of the relational needs that always sticks with me is the need for the other to initiate. Yes, that's so interesting. And, and I don't know whether that's because I need that. That that's the one that I kind of hone in on a lot of the time. But I think it is really important, even in the therapy room, for me to initiate contact with the clients. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. And another relational need that you home in a lot in so i just want to say that as i'm sitting on these podcasts is the relational need for safety and security yes yeah and you're right they represent our history yeah it's all interesting stuff this isn't it bob yes and unfortunately i know we've got to stop that's a hint of pops going over time but such a wonderful podcast this i think yeah from from a wonderful title, we've we've co we've <laughs> covered all sorts of stuff. We've been all the way there and back again. So yeah, what yeah. we're going to be looking at next time, which again is another wonderful title, is five things I wish I'd known before I became a psychotherapist. When I came to this title, Jackie, I thought my first the first title was ten things. I'm sure we'll come up with twenty but, things, Bob. But I thought if you have it. ten, we'll be here. It'll go way over time in, in the podcast. So I've cut it back to five. And now I'm thinking, talking to you, perhaps I wish I'd kept it to 10. But I'm looking forward to that. Me too. We'll see how many we come up with. I'll keep counting. <laughs> Until next time, Bob. Thank yeah. you very much. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. 
don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.